In class, you've been learning about magnetism from the perspective of current carrying wires. However, when we think about magnets, we think about something like this, a permanent magnet made of some sort of material that has a permanent magnetic dipole moment. You're probably familiar with magnets, that if I hold two poles, they have poles, north pole and a south pole, and if I push the like poles together, they repel, and if I put opposite poles together, they attract. You probably also know that some materials are attracted by magnets. For example, this Canadian nickel is made of nickel, and when I bring a magnet close to it, it attracts. That's because nickel is what's called a ferromagnetic material, and if I bring a magnetic field close to it, it creates a magnet in this material in an orientation that attracts the nickel to the magnet. There's other types of magnetism, though. There's paramagnetism and diamagnetism, and these show up in other materials. We'll be exploring the properties of kimberlite, a uh, mineral, and we'll also be exploring the properties of bismuth and see how they interact when I get them close to a permanent magnetic field. Let's talk a little bit about the theory involved in this lab. Specifically, the magnetic field that we'll be studying is going to be that of dipole magnets. Uh, you're familiar with dipoles probably because that's the kind of structure we see around an ordinary bar magnet. Uh, these are showing two magnets here with their north poles oriented towards each other and the field lines bending away from each other as they are brought close to each other, which indirectly is what's leading to the magnetic repulsion between these two dipoles. Physics views this kind of magnetism in terms of these ideas called dipoles. They're called dipoles in analogy with an electric dipole. Uh, there's no actual pole involved in the magnetic field. But we think about the magnetic field dipoles in terms of one of these loops. This is a magically current carrying loop that has driving a current I around a circle with radius A here. And we're going to be able to derive from work that you did in class that the Z component of that magnetic field, if you're on axis, the vertical axis here, uh, that's going to have a magnitude of mu naught i a squared over 2 times z squared plus a squared raised to the 3 halves power. Uh, the magic starts to happen when we replace this a squared uh, with the area of the loop. I'm going to say that that a there is really pi times a squared. That's the cross-sectional area of the loop that introduces a pi down here to make sure the algebra lines up. And then if we go ahead and we define the current around the loop times the cross-sectional area of the loop, we call that the dipole moment, little m, not the mass, but this is the dipole moment. And then we write the magnetic field like this. And remember, this is for a point here that's on axis, and we're measuring the z component straight down from the center of the loop here. So that's our z component here. And this is the magnetic field in that z direction. We further approximate, you know, because physics, uh, that z is much, much larger than a. And in doing so, that gets rid of this nasty addition term here, because algebra is even worse than coronavirus. And so we're going to go ahead and say that the z component of the magnetic field is mu naught m over 2 pi z cubed. Uh, and we'll pull this out, and this is just some constant in front. And the thing that we want to pay attention to for this lab is this 1 over z cubed uh, scaling in the magnetic field. Now, we actually need to figure out the force between this dipole magnet and anything else. And so what we're going to do is consider a case like this, where we have two dipole magnets being brought close to each other, uh, and they'll be what we call anti-aligned. So the magnets are pointed in opposite directions, but anti-aligned sounds better. Uh, Z will represent the center-to-center -center separation between these magnets, and what's going to happen is we can write down the force between the magnets by writing out the energy. Now, something that uh, we get to learn from theory is that the potential energy stored in the magnetic field for the uh, uh, for this configuration is just the magnetic moment of one dipole times the magnetic field times the cosine 
of the angle between the dipoles, where it's defined, the direction is defined for a dipole in terms of the oriented direction for the cross-sectional area. So the area vector, or the magnetic moment vector, would be pointing up perpendicular, just like the arguments you would see uh, for a flux argument, where the oriented area is defined with the right-hand rule. Now, that gives us our direction, and uh, so the cosine of the angle is the angle between the two directions for the field and the magnetic uh, moment. Now, uh, we go ahead and use the language that if the, fields are, if the dipoles are aligned, that angle theta is equal to zero, and if the po uh, dipoles are anti-aligned, we call that theta equal negative 180. If we know what the force on an object, uh, or if we know what the potential energy on an object is, we can calculate the force by just taking the gradient. Uh, if we want the z component of the force, we take the derivative of the potential energy with respect to the z direction and throw a negative sign onto it. So it's negative du by dz. Uh, and that means we can go back to the previous derivation for the dipole and write out the magnetic field of the dipole um, yeah, for one dipole and call that the source dipole, and then we call the other uh, dipole the uh, magnet that is feeling the dipole. Uh, really, I don't know why they call it m sub m. Uh, you know, variables, they're great. Anyways, uh, that just means we take the potential energy, and we take the d by dz of the magnetic field uh, strength, and you get that this has a one over z to the fourth scaling for the force. Uh, this is interesting because it's not a 1 over z squared scaling like we see for Coulomb's law or the law of universal gravitation. So this is quite a sharply rising force. Uh, it depends on the two magnetic moments uh, involved and then some fundamental constants, 3, mu naught, 2, and another version of 3. Uh, anyways, uh, these are anti-aligned uh, dipoles here. Uh, we would have a negative force would flow through because we'd start with the cosine of theta equal to negative 1. Uh, and so we would have a negative direction. So this would be a repulsive force, uh, same fundamental behavior, and then 1 over uh, z to the fourth scaling. So uh, for these aligned dipoles, uh, we would see an attractive force because the for uh, z force is greater than 0. So attractive. And then for the anti-aligned dipoles, the negative sign here indicates that the force here is repulsive. So that just tells us that the math is lining up with our uh, experience with magnets that we have already developed. Now, what's kind of interesting is that we have permanent magnets that we like to play with, but we also have the idea of induced magnetism. So this means that if I put a material into a magnetic field, it will develop a dipole moment, and that dipole moment is going to depend on uh, a lot of properties of the material and the problem. A uh, classic example you probably saw was the case of uh, metals like iron and nickel. They're not ordinarily magnets, but if I stick them into a magnetic field, it induces a strong aligned magnetic dipole, and so the metal attracts to the original magnet. The induced dipole moment that we see actually has a magnitude that depends on a few properties of the system. Uh, we can look at it in terms of the strength that the field, uh, the strength of the field where you have the object, we'll just call that B, uh, the volume of the material, big V, and then we have the property of the material called the susceptibility, and we use the Greek character chi to represent that. So the induced dipole has a comparatively simple form of chi V uh, over mu naught times the field that the dipole is in. So to calculate the force on an induced dipole, what we're going to do is we're going to return to a potential energy argument. So u is minus mb cos theta. I forgot a minus on the first time. And if I plug in my expression for the magnetic moment, I get that's chi vb over mu naught times b cos theta. So what's interesting is we actually have two powers of b here. We have one that's from the induced dipole moment, and so that's the field creating the dipole moment, and that drops off like 1 over z cubed. 
And this B is also a 1 over Z cubed, so that's just the field itself. So the field creates a dipole moment, and then it aligns that dipole moment to itself to, for the energy. To figure out the force, then, we just take the gradient again. So we take the derivative of this 1 over Z cubed times 1 over Z cubed, which turns out to be 1 over Z to the 6. Uh, and when we calculate that gradient with negative signs and constants, everything uh, put into place, we get a 1 over z to the 7th. And so that uh, shows up here and is the scaling that we actually want to measure in this lab. So that's not an exponent you really see every day. We describe the materials uh, that we deal with based on their values of the susceptibility. If chi is greater than zero, we call that a paramagnetic material, and that ends up leading to an attractive force between the magnets. Uh, if chi is less than zero, we call that diamagnetic, and that leads to a repulsive force. And if chi is greater than zero, and that magnetic field will implant and imprint a permanent magnetic field on the material, we refer to that as ferromagnetic. And so the iron and nickel that I mentioned earlier are actually ferromagnets, because if you stick them in a B field that's large enough, you can actually make magnets out of the iron and the nickel. And this is how they would make uh, primitive compasses, uh, by finding a magnetized stone and inducing a permanent magnetic moment in, for example, an iron needle. At an atomic level, what's happening here is that magnetism is arising from the spins of electrons. So in chemistry, you probably had to deal with uh, this, how electrons had spin from the Pauli exclusion principle and you know, chemistry working in general. Uh, but in uh, physics, we're kind of interested in the electrons because the spin of the electron kind of acts like this perfect magnetic dipole. And so it, since it carries angular momentum, and the electron spins, it creates a magnetic field around it, and they act like tiny little bar magnets. And so the combination of the electrons combined with the angular momentum of their orbits give different materials uh, in, in the periodic table different magnetic properties. And so the key part about a material being ferromagnetic is that it has the property where if I align the spins on the uh, materials, the crystalline structure of the metal allows that uh, new alignment to stay rigid and locked in place, leaving behind the, uh, a permanent magnet. And uh, this idea can be developed a lot further as you go on in electricity and magnetism. Uh, so I hope you get to explore these topics in a little bit more detail. However, for this lab, our main objectives are that we are here to uh, give you the opportunity to analyze the data. We've already collected the data for you because you can't actually come into the lab. And what we've done is we've gone ahead and measured the force between different samples as a function of separation. That's uh, the separation z in the previous. And you're going to go ahead for this and run an analysis of all five samples and measure the power law index m on the scaling with distance z. So you're, we're going to write down our relationship as f of z is equal to c times 1 over z to the m, where c is a constant that contains all of the physics and particular properties of the scenario. But what we really want to do is to come up with an index of m. Let's take a look at how the experiment actually works. The setup for this lab involves a strong neodymium rare earth magnet that's attached by a bar to a stage, and that stage can move up and down, and there is a vertical distance scale here measured with a Vernier scale. We're going to suspend that neodymium magnet above a sample. In this case, I'll just use a regular permanent magnet I'm going to set it onto my sample, and I'm going to measure the force that that exerts on this scale. Here it's denominated in grams, so measured in terms of the standard gravity of weight. So what we'll do is, fairly simple, we're going to move the magnet up and down. We're going to watch how the changing distance here affects the scale reading. And the process of data collection will be to put samples here on top of our standard lab-issued solo cups, uh, here separated from the scale. We're going to drop it down, measure the force at a bunch of different distances, 
uh, and record the distances and we record the force that's measured on the scale. The big issue that we're going to run into in terms of calibration is that the location of the magnet here is not going to be exactly at zero on ter in terms of the stage. But the distance we want to use in our calculation is the distance from the center of the neodymium magnet to the location and the center of the magnetic sample that we're exploring. So we'll use this to measure a fixed distance uh, using just a standard ruler. I'm going to set this up to be 15 centimeters, center to center, and make a note that that's going to read off at 122.2 on the Vernier scale. Let's go ahead and look at the data that we're actually going to give you in this experiment. You'll receive a spreadsheet of data. On that data sheet, you're going to receive a set of distance readings and scale readings. So this is the mass reading that was present on the scale, here measured in a precision of micrograms. They're very good scales. Uh, along the bottom, we have our different options for the, uh, the samples that we're going to consider. We have a dipole magnet. We have a nickel, that's a Canadian nickel, inserted in the cup vertically, so it's stuck uh, into a slot in the cup and suspended so it looks like a little semicircle. Uh, horizontal nickel is the uh, nickel uh, taped straight to the surface of the cups. Uh, we have our kimberlites, and we have our bismuth sample. In all uh, five of these cases, what we're going to do is we will give you the distance reading with the scale measured at that reading, and then we'll have the mass of the object that was placed on it and measured without any uh, uh, magnetic field around it. And so this is basically what the scale should read if there is nothing, uh, if there's no magnet present its associated uncertainty in grams. And then we have a distance offset. And this is a uh, offset in the distance reading that we have here. Thus, if you want to figure out the true distance, you need to take the value here and add it to the uh, value in this distance column so that the values you are plugging into your linear formula are the values uh, that correspond to the center to center distances of these objects. And you'll notice that those distance offsets vary here in the uh, different setups based on how we had to construct the experiment. The final thing that's worth talking about is what to do with your data. We're going to analyze the data by linearizing it. And it's a bit tricky to linearize the form because what we're really after is the power law index on our relationship. So in this case, uh, we're after the value of four. So what we need to do is take the natural log of this to linearize the expression. Unfortunately, uh, this is a mess of things with units and you can't take the natural log or really any uh, function like sine, exponential, what, uh, or anything on something with units. So we divide by an arbitrary one Newton on both sides. And so you get a giant mess of constants here uh, that we're going to just largely ignore and this one over one Newton as just our choice of units. Uh, when we take the natural log of that, we have to make sure we're also taking the log of positive numbers. So we put the whole thing in absolute values take the log of it and pull a uh, meter over a newton and this whole constant into this uh, constant here at the front. So we don't really care too much what's in it and what the units are because we're left with the actual scaling we care about. So this is just the constant we have. Uh, from the rules of logs, the minus four shows up as the slope of this relationship. And then our x variable here is the log of the distance z. Uh, this will be the slope uh, in a straight line, so the 4, negative 4 in this case. Uh, C here is going to correspond to our y-intercept, or b, in our standard form. And then the log of the force over some uh, fundamental force is going to be uh, the y. So we're going to use our Linus to analyze our data once we've taken this log. This is largely an argument that we can get away with uh, the 
non-dimensionalizing to any set of units we want because all of the mess ends up in the constant. Thus, you will hopefully always end up with the same uh, slope for your linear relationship, no matter your choices of units, uh, but the constants will be varied and you won't be able to compare them among each other.